At Harvard Extension School, we believe the 21st century museum professional has a critical role to play in addressing global issues like climate change, decolonization, and social justice. As a student in our Museum Studies program, you can explore these topics and more in courses like Museums and Material Culture, Managing the Museum in the 21st Century, and Close Looking. Beyond the classroom, learning extends to many museums around Harvard. Experience the treasures of arts and science at the Arnold Arboretum, the Harvard Art Museums, the Peabody Museum, and the Museum of the Ancient Near East, just to name a few. In the program, you can customize your path, taking courses in other fields like sustainability and digital media design. You can also work toward a graduate certificate in topics like nonprofit management and digital storytelling. We invite you to learn more at extension.harvard.edu forward slash museum studies. Welcome everybody. I see we have a nice crowd here and um, I want to thank uh, Sarah and um, uh, for giving us such a nice boost and uh, we really have a couple of great speakers here as we talk about um, climate change and historic preservation in museums. Um, this is a great group. Um, uh, Mystic Seaport and um, Strawberry Bank have both uh, suffered um, from this already. And I uh, do not currently run a shoreline uh, organization, but for many, many years, I ran the Newport Restoration Foundation, uh, which um, had regular prob problems with this, and we're gonna focus on it. And in 2016, that led us at the Restoration Foundation to create the um, first ever national conference on historic preservation and um, uh, climate change. And so some of what you're going to hear today from me is based on that. Um, with that, I'm gonna give you a, a brief intro and um, let me get this going here. Much of this you will know already. Um, <laughs> this is an old phrase that really relates to navigation, but um, time and tide um, are once again waiting for nobody. And uh, it's an apt phrase for us to use in the modern era as well. So what's the problem? Um, uh, as you can see here uh, from, for the purposes of today's panel, um, it's really important to remember that our global coastlines have not changed uh, much since the last ice age. And yet um, in the next uh, 80 years or so, we're going to see drastic changes in the coastline around the world. Um, global warming um, is happening in the oceans and um, uh, while the extent of how much the ocean is going to rise is um, up for debate at this point, there's no question that it is. And uh, it could be rising anywhere from as little as three feet to as much as 11 or 12 feet. Um, but from a point of view of cultural resources, um, uh, Shoreline features are going to change all over the place. Um, and I find this a useful metric uh, to explain the problem of climate change to people. Um, people somehow feel that uh, history is immutable, um, but it's not. Um, the uh, Statue of Liberty could be an unvisitable place. Uh, Ellis Island might be destroyed. And as you can see, um, this little island in the photograph below um, that's from prehistory is also at risk. And so we tend to look back at our predecessors and think, well, my great, great grandparents saw that and so forth and so on. Um, those features are all at risk of being erased um, by rising sea levels. Um, as I said, a rise of three to 10 feet by 2100 remains the, um, uh, the best agreed on, but you can look at um, this tide gauge, which is at the Newport Naval Station um, and registers tides uh, during the date range that I'm showing here. 
um, it's considered to be a particularly reliable tide gauge because it's never been moved or changed since it was installed in 1932. And um, we often think, well, it's going up a foot or two. What does that really mean? Um, it means a great deal. Um, and um, this uh, house, I think, is one that you can easily find if you go online and look at Hurricane Sandy. Um, but um, uh, this is something where we're thinking that not only are there going to be more storms, all you have to do is look at the number of hurricanes. We're deep into the Greek alphabet at this point, um, but also the severity of them. Um, and what that means in New England can be um, a little bit interesting and subtle according to the science. Um, but the other thing is, even if you're not on the waterline, um, we've seen a huge increase in major rain events over the last 30 years. Uh, just think if you're, well, at my age of 60, um, but even if you're in your 40s or 50s, you think back to the fact that it used to rain a little bit in New England. It would be a quarter of an inch or so, and then it would be sunny for a day, and, and then it would rain a little bit again. Now we'll go through these long dry spells, and then we get what are known as major rain events, which is an inch or more over the course of the event. And uh, these deluges are common now. Um, just here in my house, we've had a couple of them in the last, in the last few weeks. Um, and that is, that is climate change. And so that can lead to riverine flooding. Uh, it can also mean just that your historic structure is uh, at risk in a way that it wasn't before. And so now I'm going to um, turn over um, to the first of our esteemed experts, and that's Rodney Rowland from Strawberry Bank. Take it away, Rodney. Thank you, Peter. All right, let me share this here. Hopefully everybody see that. Um, good morning, afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, so Starby Bank, as Peter said, has been uh, negatively impacted by climate change. Um, we believe it's been going on for probably a couple of decades, uh, but th our impacts are, as you'll see, um, less visible than they might be in other areas. Um, first, uh, for those of you who don't know Starby Bank, uh, we're a nine acre site uh, located in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, roughly 450 feet from the banks of the Piscataqua River. Um, we are, uh, one of the things that makes Starry Bank unique is that a lot of our 32 historic structures are on their original uh, foundations. Um, so uh, it's, it's not a, a created neighborhood, we're using an existing neighborhood to teach uh, over 300 years of history and really the evolution of how this neighborhood has changed through time. It's, it's quite a, a beautiful place. Um, in the winter, uh, we introduce a, an outdoor skating rink uh, on the large green field at the center of the museum. Um, it's just a nice compliment for the community, um, especially this year with people looking for things to do on the outside. We have great hopes it'll be a, a nice popular spot. Uh, and again, there's the Piscataqua River in the background and way across the river is the um, Portsmouth Daverill Shipyard, one of the oldest shipyards in the United States. Um, most of us looking at this talk right now um, are preservationists. Um, we are passionate about what we do. Uh, we are passionate about the places we work. And when we work in beautiful places like this, we want to preserve them. Uh, and, I, and I argue that, that all of us are, are working to preserve something somehow, some way. Uh, even if you make a contribution to your favorite place, um, you're working to preserve that place. And I, and I admit as preservationists that uh, it, sometimes we, uh, we do things to preserve things and they're easier than others. Um, here's an example of some easy preservation, though I don't advocate the use of duct tape on your collections. Um, there's some easy preservation uh, tactics out there, but uh, my topic today is not an easy one. It's water and Strawberry Bank, uh, unfortunately is located at a low point in the city of Portsmouth. And so it's been filling up like a gigantic bowl um, where um, we're seeing more and more water accumulate um, that then eventually gets in and impacts our buildings. This was shot in 2018. 
Um, you should uh, also understand that the large green field that I've been showing you was once a waterway. Uh, it was known as Puddle Dock, and it was where the flat bottom barges came in to offload wares for the early settlers to this neighborhood. Um, that is part of the complex problem that we're facing because water has a memory and where once was water, water will be again. And that's certainly what we've been seeing. These are images from last year. Um, you can see uh, our buildings are at risk from surface flooding. Uh, the images on the left and in the center. Um, very typical these days, uh, multi events each year as heavier, heavier rains come down in a shorter amount of time. That's further complicated by um, groundwater intrusion um, in the basements of our houses. Uh, basically what's occurring is the Piscataqua River is being pushed higher and higher whether it be from a king tide that many of you have may have witnessed in the last uh, three days, because we're in a king tide event right now, or from storm surges, um, which we've seen in the news um, hundreds of times over the last few years. Um, that The force of that water in the river is pushing up the groundwater under our buildings, and that water is now entering our basements. This is not a unique phenomenon to Strawberry Bank. Uh, these are regional images that I took um, last year. Um, roadways that have been in existence for over 100 years are now flooding on a more regular basis as that water is pushed across those surfaces. Uh, parks uh, and, and indeed historic neighborhoods are all impacted more and more frequently by these storms. Some of the conditions that we're seeing in our basements as a result of this groundwater intrusion or surface flooding intrusion um, obviously metal objects corroding, bricks and mortar deteriorating, wood rot. Um, and then sort of a secondary result is that relative humidity levels in those basements, because water is being introduced to them so frequently, we're seeing relative humidity from, um, for six months out of the year, roughly 80 to 90 percent. Uh, and if any of you have experienced humid, high humidity, you know what it feels like. Um, you know it res results in mold and mildew issues, and of course, insect damage. <clears throat> so what do we do as preservationists? Well, we respond and we react. We figure out how to deal with this new threat to what we are so passionate about. And that's the case at Strawberry Bank Museum and in the greater community of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The first thing we do is we study what is exactly going on. Uh, many of our partners, like the University of New Hampshire and the city of Portsmouth, have been studying this for years. Uh, and they have been very helpful in using Strawberry Bank as a, a target for those studies so that we can better understand the impacts that are occurring. We do our own studies to determine where, how the water is flowing, where it's going, how it's getting there. Um, one of those studies is with the University of New Hampshire. Uh, and is a ground water uh, well system. You can see that in the lower left. Uh, we're putting wells in the ground with sensors so that we can see when the groundwater hits those points, uh, measures the salinity level to understand if it's fresh or salt water. Um, and so that helps us track where the water's going and how it's getting into our basements. Uh, we also have done uh, time-lapse photography in one of the basements here at Strawberry Bank. You may see that on YouTube. Um, it's, it's been quite popular and uh, there'll actually be a link to our website so you can see that video uh, later on. Uh, but these are all things that we discover as we're going along. As I mentioned, the city of Portsmouth uh, for quite some time was studying uh, the vulnerabilities of the city um, to mainly surface flooding from the river. Uh, they then invited Strawberry Bank to join uh, in that effort uh, and we sort of introduced the concept of groundwater intrusion to that. Uh, study and so they're taking a step back to understand those impacts along with surface flooding. Uh, they were also uh, a key player in uh, developing an understanding of what areas of the city were at risk and, and um, at risk the most and uh, so they can prioritize um, adaptation strategies as they are funded. And of course I'm happy to say that Strawberry Bank is one of the top priorities. So what else do we do? Well, we advocate, we must advocate. Um, this problem was not caused by Strawberry Bank Museum. It was caused by 
the greater community. Um, and we're gonna need everyone's help to see it solved. So we advocate, um, we um, end up in publications, uh, we write op-ed pieces, uh, we do lectures just like this one, and we tell our stories about what's happening and we continue to do that as we continue along this journey to discover a greater solution to the problem. Uh, Peter mentioned the uh, conference uh, that the Newport Restoration uh, Program started, uh, Keeping History Above Water. Uh, it is the best conference for this topic. I've attended many, many years. I spoke uh, in Annapolis a couple of years ago. Um, it's uh, a really, uh, it's a real feel good opportunity uh, if you're dealing with these issues to be in a room with many other people who are dealing with the same things. You'll discover that some people are maybe ahead of where you're at and many others were behind where you're at and the sharing of ideas uh, is just amazing. So I do, I do want to make, make, make that point that this is a great opportunity for people. We, far, we form partnerships. Um, partnerships are absolutely fundamentally important to this. Um, Strawberry Bank could not have done this alone. And as we began to spread the word, um, our phones were ringing and our email boxes were filling up with offers to help from um, hydrologists interested in the studies that we're doing of the groundwater flows and how that can be solved uh, to the city of Portsmouth who um, has funding available uh, that they get through um, the EPA uh, and they need to use some of those funds for public outreach and recognizing that Strawberry Bank is much better at public outreach than the city is. Um, so we form partnerships that way. Uh, other government agencies, especially in New Hampshire, uh, whose uh, goal it is to bring awareness to the greater public and to study these issues. Um, these are all of our partners that we've formed over the last few years. And of course, like any good institution, we raise money. <laughs> Uh, when Strawberry Bank realized that this was the biggest threat that probably the museums ever faced, um, it became part of our capital campaign because money, of course, is going to matter like it does for all problems we try to solve. And we adapt. We have to adapt. That's very clear. Sarah made that very clear. Um, the solutions to these problems are adaptations to solving them. Um, so we've begun to adapt. Uh, we've done some of the easier changes, um, improving uh, some pumps into in our basements, uh, making slight modifications to some of the architecture of, the, of our houses so that the water can no longer gain entrance into those basements, cleaning up our basements, removing the mud floors and putting in poured concrete floors that keep that water out of the uh, basement areas and direct them to perimeter drains. There's a perimeter drainage system on the, uh, on the left there. Um, dehumidification system. So in some cases, we're not gonna be able to keep the water out. So how can we reduce that relative humidity and dry out the basement very quickly so it doesn't uh, cause deterioration to the structure as a whole? Uh, and then um, again, putting down, a, instead of a concrete floor, we've done a, a moisture membrane with uh, gravel and keeping the structural elements out of that uh, wet, uh, environment so that they can stay in good condition. The last thing, of course, we do as educational institutions is we teach. Um, I think perhaps a while ago, people thought museums teach history, um, and that was important, uh, and we still do. But today, more than ever, uh, museums need to teach many different platforms. Um, the curriculum coming from the state Curriculum board mandates that uh, certain things are more important to teach than others. And so we have diversified our teaching at Strawberry Bank to accommodate those needs of our teachers and the local schools. Um, so we're going to install a gallery exhibit. In fact, it's about 50% done at this point and we'll open once uh, COVID allows that to uh, occur. Um, the gallery exhibit is in partnership with the city of Portsmouth. Uh, this uh, panel, for example, is um, one of the uh, city's panels. Uh, Think Blue is their major initiative to bring public awareness uh, about stormwater, uh, how, where it goes when you see it go down the drain in the street in front of your home, uh, where it goes, is it treated, is it not treated, um, how does it contribute to water pollution, to higher water levels, and what you can do to help. 
Um, the gallery um, exhibit is called Water Has a Memory, Preserving Strawberry Bank and Portsmouth from Sea Level Rise. Um, it does a really good job of trying to educate people um, not only about sea level rise, but because we are a museum and we teach history, we want that to be part of the exhibit as well. Uh, one of my favorite parts um, is going to be a large flat screen, touch screen television that's mounted on the wall. It'll have a series of date buttons that you can see on the lower part of the screen there. Uh, a visitor will touch a specific date and the shutters will open to reveal what the viewscape was out the window immediately to the left of this interactive display. So then that's basically the green area that I showed you earlier on in this talk. So you'll be able to see what it looked like in the 1600s when the only people living in this area were indigenous people. And then you'll begin to see the, um, the changes that occurred due to European settlement in the 1700s and 1800s. And then you'll notice that we keep going forward until what we call the future. And that's where sea level rise really comes into play. The question is, is this the future of Strawberry Bank? I'm sure there's a little you know, humor in there with the dinosaur, but you get the idea. We want to try to engage people. We want them to get to understand the seriousness of the threat and what they can do to help. There'll be numerous panels in the gallery that talk about the experiences at Strawberry Bank and in the greater Portsmouth area. Um, sort of a national picture as well. Uh, some incredible imagery that's been taken of King Tide events in this area over the last couple of years. Uh, and then of course, the steps that we're taking to combat the impacts. We also wanted to make sure that this gallery experience wasn't only for our visitors because it's too important to not engage visitors to the site when we're closed. Um, so we, we're gonna be introducing uh, a number of outdoor uh, exhibit panels. There's two in place already um, to make sure that as people walk our site after hours or in the winter season, they're also being informed about this impact. Uh, at some point, we hope to have an outside kiosk that will be an interactive exercise for pedestrians and visitors to our site, again, when we're closed. Uh, we just think that's also a very important part of this. Uh, this particular outside sign was um, a joint effort between Strawberry Bank and the Rockingham Planning Commission and the city of Portsmouth. Uh, you can find these signs all over the uh, coastal plain of New Hampshire. Every town has multiple uh, signs like this. Again, just to bring awareness of the issues um, that are coming about. So that's what we're doing here at Strawberry Bank. Uh, I do uh, welcome questions, comments. Uh, you can see my email there. Um, also a couple of websites, um, our website where we keep track of all of our uh, sustainable Strawberry Bank information and also the city of Portsmouth's uh, sustainability climate resiliency efforts. So thank you very much. And I'll unshare my screen here. and turn it over to Chris. All right, thanks Rodney. I'm going to, uh, actually it kind of looks like we may have followed the same outline for our presentations and uh, I guess this topic kind of lends that way. I'm gonna share my screen now and get going. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us on this uh, important topic. I'm Chris Kisorek. I'm the Vice President of Watercraft Preservation and Programs here at Mystic Seaport Museum. I've been here about three and a half years, and one of the first uh, things that struck me as I acclimated myself to our infrastructure was that one section of the museum was starting to flood pretty frequently and asked around a bit to see, is this normal? Has this always happened? Is this something new? and got uh, as many different answers as I asked questions, but uh, you know, really keyed me into the fact, and I think many of us have experienced the fact that uh, the human memory is not really set up to deal with uh, things changing on a climate scale. So decided to go a little deeper into it and discovered, uh, as we'll get into further, uh, that no, it really hadn't been happening other than uh, extreme events such as, as large hurricanes. Oops. Let me get my screen to advance. Oh, 
little touchy. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Mystic Seaport, we do occupy a long stretch of the Mystic River in Mystic, Connecticut. And this uh, shows where the 100 year flood line is. And that, you know, is supposed to be once every 100 years. But uh, as time goes on, we're getting that more and more often. Fortunately, not quite to this extent, but uh, you can see that as a site of two former shipyards, they didn't build ships in the mountains and uh, low ground was the preferred spot and we have uh, inherited that spot and inherited where the uh, river would like to go back to. If we look at um, the site of Mystic Seaport in 1942, you see a large part of what is now our village green was, uh, was marsh and as Rodney said, the water has memory and the water wants to go back to become that marsh again. A lot of this was was fill, low areas, and we are dealing with that and figuring out uh, how we are going to address that. A big part of our, our historic village, uh, fortunate for us, many of those historic buildings were moved here. They're not on their original foundations, which may give us flexibility in the future, but are all centered on what was a marsh in, uh, I mean, as, early, as recently as the 1940s. So what do we see now? And uh, this is these are some photos from winter uh, a few years ago. That is our uh, one of our primary transient boater docks where we do get significant museum revenue. And you know one thing about this is how do we raise up this as a problem to our museum leadership and trustees? And rather than dive in and you know have a debate about uh, the causes of climate change, the uh, financial language uh, reaches all and showing that you know this is something that is happening more and more and it's something that is affecting the, the bottom line and our sustainability so you know this is january showing our our dock flooded but this dock does flood now in the in the spring and summer as well as uh during storms in the fall and does have a direct influence on uh revenue at the museum uh, here's our area of the green and our south entrance showing you know, I wasn't standing in the deepest part of the water when I had the uh, measuring tape in there. That just happened to be basically the height of my boots. So uh, it's over a foot of water and icy water in the winter really filling up. One time when this becomes an issue is uh, our normal winter Christmas activity of lantern light tours comes in and starts right at that spot. And we would get the, you know, nor'easters and, and winter storms and we would have to cancel, you know, of the many nights of the uh, performance, we would have to cancel several a season, which never used to happen. Again, affecting uh, you know the bottom line and, and our budgets. And as I said, this used to be a winter experience and, and no one ever remembered this happening in the summer. And here is actually some of our summer campers. Uh, and you can see the big tent set up. This is right before a wooden boat show where we would have our most guests and visitors of the year uh, having to trudge across a lake. Uh, we were out the next morning with every bilge pump we could muster to try and drain this out and drain the water from the tent. And you know, it's that tent where it is used to be a, uh, a marsh and here it is, is trying to be again. Uh, so when I first arrived, I started, you know, after asking around and getting multiple answers, I said, well, how, how often does this happen? So a, a real flood for us is anything over five feet uh, above mean low or low water. And so I went back and uh, I put this little chart together showing from 1980. And if you go back 70s, 60s, 50s, there, it, was, it was never that high. So uh, once in 1980, twice in 1990, never in 2000, once in 2010, and nine times in 2018. And if we add in uh, Connecticut's estimate for uh, sea level rise for 2050, we could see 60 events per year of uh, similar to that uh, kids walking through a puddle. So this is emerging, this is changing quickly and it is uh, accelerating to where we're going to face it very often. Uh, just a, a view of New London Tide, you know, the, uh, the tidal epic as they give you 20, sec 20 year pieces of uh, time for forecasting tides. Uh, you notice the blue line and the red uh, don't match. That's predicted and actual. So that uh, really is showing what uh, where sea level rise is today. We're seeing it every day and it's measurable every day and it's it's increasing. Uh, 
an average of the 30 highest tides per year at Mystic Seaport. Uh, as you can see, other than 2015, it's, it's a steady curve and steadily increasing from 1980 uh, under four feet to 2018, 4.8 feet. Uh, that, that's a huge change in a, in a relatively small geologic time scale. So as an institution, how are we facing this? We, uh, we started to look at how we could reimagine that village green from a programmatic standpoint. And what came up immediately was really the big problem to face there is sea level rise. And it really turned the conversation for the whole museum into how do we address sea level rise and what can we do about it? And can we be a leader? Uh, <clears throat> so we started some working groups, both internal and external on uh, coastal adaptation, campus infrastructure and uh, programs. Each of these were internal and external experts, uh, met several times, put together kind of a structure for looking forward and taking us where we're headed with that. Uh, <clears throat> looking at some of the working groups were really interesting conversations. And on the internal, external side, we are really able to narrow down uh, what our needs are and realizing that uh, while we feel, felt like maybe we were a little behind in uh, jumping onto this, uh, we also realized that just not just as a museum, but as a community, um, we had a long way to go. And finding that one of our maybe key activities in this is to really be a local convener of uh, the local community. And that if we make our own actions and just solving our small problems that that's not going to be enough solution for us as if we put a wall around the museum then we'll be nice and dry but uh, the road that gets to the museum and gets to mystic that is susceptible to flooding and it won't help us if we're high and dry if the road is uh, impassable so that it really we need to look at uh, problems opportunities etc but not just from a local standpoint at the museum we need to complain our neighbors uh, both locally, regionally, and uh, state and nationally. An interesting thing about Mystic is that the river uh, divides two towns, so two geographic separate towns, both uh, sharing a river that is susceptible to flooding, and the planning commissions for each of those towns had never really talked to each other. So, you know, if there were to be an estuary approach, estuary level approach to sea level rise and flooding, uh, one side might do one thing and the other the other and uh, neither of them may control the river so just getting all of those folks in the same room and sitting down and saying hey this this needs to be addressed and we're ready to be uh, the intermediary and, and get everybody together uh, really jumped out as a, as a strong point in uh, what we found putting these groups together a uh, couple of things we sat down and, and you know, really define our risks and you know we think of flooding as a risk but there are other risks that come with climate change in addition to the uh, the water at our feet. Uh, one example is last September, we did a launch of the Mayflower II restoration, a four-year restoration that we did in the shipyard here. And that was launched in mid-September. And during the ceremony, we actually had three or four incidences of heat stroke amongst visitors that, you know, recalled uh, we needed ambulances and uh, respond to those incidents. And normally, you know, we think about that in, in July, August, but uh, in mid-September, uh, heat stroke is, is not something that we're really on the outlook as a risk, but we, we're going to have to kind of change how we view risk in this, and it's, it's not just in flooding. Uh, determine the adaptations. Uh, when we look at adaptations to sea level rise, a lot of things that pop up are, you know, put in an oyster reef or natural grasses, and, and those are wonderful, and those have places in in our estuary. However, we are a uh, home to many historic vessels that tie up at, at docks and wharves and uh, putting in an oyster reef is not going to work well with uh, floating the Charles W. Morgan in and out. So we need to look at other options for hard infrastructure and how we can adapt. So we have reached out to partners that uh, also share those issues. And with any crisis, as many of us have seen with uh, COVID as well, there are uh, opportunities with uh, all with 
peril as well. And this has given us the opportunity to reach out to other stakeholders um, and really divide up and find what we can do and start looking at uh, best practices that we hope to be able to share with other institutions that are facing the same issues. Uh, some of the takeaways from the committees is we can't do it alone. We need to work both uh, with our local governments, our other local universities that are studying this and other museum communities like we're doing today. Uh, all levels, as I said, regional, state, national, and try to be a convener. Uh, you'll be surprised by the groups that are not talking to each other as I uh, discussed with uh, you know, the two towns along our river and how we can bring, bring all these groups together. Uh, just going to touch on a couple of planning partners, as I uh, mentioned, and Rodney showed a lot of their partners. We have we have many, and I just grabbing one to show, because it's uh, it's you know trying to plan for sea level rise on a large institution. Uh, there are lots of consultants and uh, folks who would love to come in and and, and take a lot of money to uh, give ideas and and discuss this. But we're all learning. And uh, there are educational institutes that are, are trying to learn and looking for uh, projects as, uh, you know, to do student projects on how to adapt, mitigate these things. Two that we have had uh, relationships with are the University of Rhode Island School of Landscape Architecture and uh, another national institution that uh, has a lot of ships docked and a lot of vulnerable places is the uh, U.S. Coast Guard Academy's Department of Civil Engineering. So I'm just going to highlight uh, one student project from the URI School of Landscape Architecture that uh, dove in and gave us some ideas of how we could reimagine the, uh, the, the green at Mystic Seaport. And they really did an amazing project, uh, dove into all aspects of, uh, you know, could we move buildings? Could we readdress? Could we make something of the uh, what used to be a marsh turned into a green and could we use that to something that would be a great educational opportunity so we can share the experience and share with the public and visitors what is happening with sea level rise. So their uh, one group's interesting idea was to kind of change boardwalk around but uh, oops uh, well actually I bunched out of that. Uh, <laughs> Jumped out a little too quick, but really a neat way to turn our village green into a new uh, kind of center of the museum that focuses on water and the, the changes that water is bringing to the museum while uh, moving some of the other things to elevated ground. So it's been really exciting to work with these institutions and these students who are going to be the future leaders and they are fully diving into sea level rise and climate change as a big part of their future and I, they may have some local ones that uh, institutions doing the same that might help uh, other institutions here. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back to uh, Peter and uh, look forward to questions later. Peter, you're on mute. Thanks, Chris. Um, technology. Uh, thanks, we're getting some really great pres uh, uh, presentations here and um, so I'm going to switch over um, thematically a little bit here. Uh, I always like to uh, make sure that we're catering to as many audiences as we can um, with an EMA audience. And an awful lot of us um, don't have, um, where am I? There we are. Um, don't have uh, huge multi-site um, uh, museums. Uh, we've got a single uh, building that we are responsible for. And so um, I want in this presentation to really think about sort of what some of the uh, tactical um, things are. And both of my co-presenters can also um, add to this in the q and I'm sure. Um, but we're going to take a look at uh, Newport, Rhode Island, um, which um, famously had the hurricane of 1938, um, which was one of the largest hurricanes ever to hit the Rhode Island, or excuse me, the New England area. Um, as you can see from the statistics there, not only a really high wind speeds, but an incredible surge and a forward speed that out at sea, I think, uh, hit 65 miles an hour at one point, which is, I believe, the record for a fastest moving forward speed of a hurricane uh, anywhere. Um, 
And we're going to focus on a certain part of Newport, uh, which is known as Easton's Point or just the point. Um, and ironically, um, <laughs> if it hadn't been for COVID, this large white block that's right next to the harbor, um, sort of in the bottom of the orange part, uh, is um, uh, the hotel that we all would have been sitting in today. Um, and the structure that we're going to focus on is uh, just a couple of blocks in from that on Bridge Street um, and uh, is a very histo uh, a significant historic structure. Um, I do want to point out that we're talking about New England today, but we're not alone. Charleston has issues. Um, and just to sort of re-echo what, um, uh, what Chris was saying about frequency and what's happening down in Annapolis in what's known as Ego Alley. Um, and uh, their frequency is um, likewise increasing to the point where flooding is going to happen on an almost daily basis uh, in another 30 years or so. So not that long. Um, the structure that we're going to look at is the Christopher Townsend House, a very important historic structure, which um, I uh, actually led an effort to uh, accession for the organization. Christopher Townsend, along with his brother Job, uh, were the progenitors um, of the Newport style of cabinet making in the 18th century. Um, and when we bought the house, um, we and acquired it, we did not realize fully uh, just that it sat at the very lowest uh, spot um, in the point section of town. Um, the uh, base of the basement, it's one of those lovely low 18th century basements that a six foot three person like me almost has to squat over double to get into, um, uh, is only uh, four feet above mean high, high water. Uh, interestingly enough, the shoreline is nine feet above mean high, high water. So um, you're actually, excuse me, the grade level is four feet above mean high, high water. Um, so uh, this is the only 18th century house that I've ever been into that during any high tide at all, um, didn't even have to be a king tide, you could go down there and it um, smelled uh, like the ocean. Um, there was definitely briny water uh, coming in through the groundwater and into the basement of this house, which is set about three blocks back from the waterfront itself. Um, so it became sort of a canary in the coal mine. Um, and as we were putting together the Keeping History Above Water conference, um, we um, were really looking at using this house as an example. And we created a uh, small published piece, which I'm sure is out of print by now, um, called Keeping um, uh, 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 Bridge Street Above Water. Um, so here's Hurricane Sandy um, in that neighborhood, and you're actually looking at the Marriott Hotel down the street there, but this is the in uh, intersection of Third and Bridge Streets um, on October 28th. I could not get close enough to the Townsend house to actually take a photograph of it during Sandy. But here it is just a month earlier. And this is just a king tide um, and a rainstorm combined. And you can see that the that is the Townsend house in the corner there um, prior to our um, acquiring it. Um, but you can see that it's, uh, um, it's flooding at the street level, um, not deeply, um, but you, you can bet that it's four feet deep in the basement of that house at this point. So uh, let's talk a little bit about historic structures themselves. Um, as I point out here, uh, any historic buildings, um, as we see at Strawberry Bank, um, and as we see at old coastal communities around, um, the historic neighborhoods are almost always closest to the water. Um, the second bullet point there is also interesting in that um, uh, the Christopher Townsend House, like many other 18th century houses, are actually pretty good at resisting flooding events. Um, lime mortars uh, tend to uh, dry out pretty quickly. Um, old plasters tend to dry out pretty quickly. Um, uh, old building materials do pretty well. Um, uh, any boat builder will tell you that it's not salt water that rots a boat. It's constant wetting and drying. So salt water is not necessarily a problem for old wood. Um, old basements are kind of porous. Things run into them. They run out of them. Um, 
if they're given the chance to. Uh, the materials um, that are the greatest problem in sort of preserving uh, old buildings are often the newer, his, the newer fabrics that have been added in. Sheetrock really doesn't do well uh, when it's flooded. Um, electrical systems, in some cases plumbing systems, certainly heating systems, um, they're the things that are vulnerable uh, in an old building. Um, now, of course, you know, any windy hurricane can knock things down. But um, I did mention before that precipitation is an issue as well. Uh, this isn't so much a sea level rise issue, although it can be, as we'll see in another slide. Um, but this is an issue uh, that we're seeing across the country. Um, Hawaii, interestingly enough, is the only part of the uh, of anywhere um, in the USA that has actually seen a decline in rainfall, which is concerning to them for different reasons. But you can see that the Northeast, and I will tell you that um, Southern New England in particular is the real point of the spear here, has seen a 71% increase in major rain events. Um, as I suggested before, uh, these can be real flooding events, but they're also an issue because um, roofs, historic roofs, aren't used to uh, shedding major rain events on a regular basis. Um, historic drainage is often not up to this task. Um, so you can find that your drainage systems around historic buildings are not moving the water away particularly well. It's also a problem for landscapes. Um, uh, small, lightly soaking events that happen on a very regular basis and aren't terribly heavy are uh, better for plants than um, heavy soaking events where a good portion of the rain, the ground gets saturated so fast that a good portion of the rain is just runoff. So you might have the same um, amount of rainfall in an area, um, but it's not penetrating to the, uh, through to the ground level as well. Um, a big problem with these major rain events is that when you get to uh, tidal areas, uh, and coastal areas, uh, you will find that there are tide gates as the water has risen at the water level, and here we're looking at the point section again in Newport, um, there are tide gates built into the stormwater system that keeps uh, high tides from coming back in to uh, a neighborhood. Now what happens if one of those tidal events or a storm surge um, is encountering a rainstorm, as it always will in a hurricane. Um, so a major rain event is coming down that hill because coastlines are all on a hill, right? Gradual or not. Um, so the rain's all coming down the hill and it's wanting to drain out through the stormwater system, but the tide gates are shut, so it has no place to go. So immediately that rises up um, through the stormwater system and floods the streets and floods any buildings that are there as well. So this is an example of one of those. Um, here we are looking, um, uh, looking north uh, along, the, uh, along Bridge Street. And once again, you can see the Christopher Townsend house, the big red house right there. Um, this was not anything extraordinary. There was enough of a surge that the tide gate shut. It was just a normal uh, king tide or <laughs> as much as you can call a king tide normal these days. Um, and there was a rain and snow event and the rain and the snow all came cascading down the hill and it didn't have any place to go. So um, I can talk for a few minutes about some of the um, methods that you can use to um, alleviate these things. One um, is what are called flood vents. Um, these are literally, as you can see, this vent is in the side of the building. Um, it's in the foundation usually. And if the foundation of a building fills up with water, uh, it can do a lot of damage to the structure above. It can float the whole structure away in an extreme uh, situation. And so if you relieve the pressure by giving the water some place to go, um, it actually uh, is um, a great way to uh, help save the building. There's a building at uh, the Driggs um, uh, Shipwright Shop. It's a blacksmith shop, um, for those of you who don't know what a shipsmith is. Um, is um, a building that's literally built on the ground. Um, it has no foundation. And putting some cleverly disguised um, vents, flood vents, into the side of that building, uh, if they have an extreme surge event, 
would allow the water to literally pass through a building that's built right on the turf anyway. Um, raising the basement, um, what I sometimes call high stepping. You're actually, uh, this was something that I think was done after I left um, the Restoration Foundation in the Christopher Townsend House, um, was literally to uh, raise, the, um, raise the grade level um, below ground. Um, because there were um, uh, some pumps running uh, literally 24-7 down there to try and suppress the water. So raising the grade level, it's only a temporary measure because sooner or later um, the tides are going to rise um, to a point and the water level is going to rise to a point in the point section where um, you can't um, this, this just won't be enough, but um, it can solve the problem for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so this is the other um, interesting solution to this is, of course, to raise the entire building. Historic preservationists somewhat rightly are concerned that this changes the whole uh, massing of a historic neighborhood. Uh, this is actually another town, uh, Townsend house that is right across the street corner from the Christopher Townsend house. And um, uh, it dates to the 18th century. It's actually a mashup of two historic properties. The one in the back, the one and a half story structure is uh, actually a, uh, another structure from another part, in part of town. Um, but this caused an enormous uh, uproar in the Historic District Commission about whether it was allowable to raise a house like this. Um, they ended up, the, the owners wanted to raise it six feet. Um, the Historic District Commission allowed that maybe two and a half to three feet would be right. I think they settled on four feet, nine inches or some bizarre uh, number. Um, the interesting thing though, is that if you're going to follow the federal um, flood plain guidelines, this house should have been raised 13 feet. Um, and that's a pretty astonishing level. And if you walk around what's really a very intact 18th century neighborhood that represents the point section in Newport um, with dozens and dozens of 18th century houses, um, it would be a disturbing way to look at it. And yet at the same time, I think historic preservation uh, is facing an existential issue in climate change and sea level rise in coastal communities. And there have been plenty of instances over the last 200 years where houses have adapted, buildings have adapted to meet new challenges. Um, and this may just, we may have to come to a reckoning as preservationists where we say um, this uh, is, this is an, an adaptation that is going to be necessary um, because otherwise this building will not survive. This is one of my favorite things. Um, we would have uh, flooding and they often refer to this by the way as nuisance flooding. Um, uh, it's uh, far from a nuisance, but we would have nuisance flooding in a historic structure on the point section. And uh, we would, um, the, the principal damage that we would receive was really to systems in the basement. As I said, the house recovered from this quite easily. The structure recovered quite easily. But what we would lose would be the electrical panel, the HVAC system. And there really is no reason why you can't uh, move these things up to a higher floor and just move them out of the basement and return the basement in, in essence to what it was in the 18th century, which was simply a foundation to hold up the rest of the house. Um, wall mounted boilers take up considerably less room. Um, this is not a, um, an advertisement for Navian that was just the easiest ones to find. Um, but uh, these systems uh, can be even smaller than the ones that you see here and can include uh, hot water makers as well. Um, it's certainly easy enough to move the, um, uh, move the electrical panels and systems up higher. Um, there are other defensive mechanisms that you can take to uh, make an electrical system on the first floor, should that get flooded out, um, easier to replace as well. So this is, a, this is a good technique. And if you've had a flood um, and you get that insurance settlement, uh, that's the time to do this. Um, you're going to have some money to work with at that point, and you move the systems at that point. 
Um, I just want to say a quick word about the Netherlands. Uh, one of the things I did when we were um, preparing for uh, the Keeping History Above Water conference for the first one is uh, being Dutch by heritage. Uh, I thought, well, you know, the Netherlands has kind of solved this. And I went and talked to um, uh, an architect down in New Orleans who created something called the Dutch Dialogues in the um, in the year or two right after um, uh, right after Hurricane Katrina. And um, the Dutch certainly have come up with some very interesting, very innovative solutions, but the scale of the problem for us is completely different than it is for the Netherlands. First of all, they've been engineering their systems for centuries. Second of all, um, if you take the, just the coastline of the Chesapeake Bay, which is of course a very large complex coastline, but just the coastline of that one part of the US coast, that's about three quarters of all of the coast of the Netherlands. And so that I think gives you a sense of the scope of the problem that we face here in this country, especially when it comes to historic communities. So um, who is affected? There can be a temptation to say, you know, I'm not next to the coast, this isn't my problem, or I'm not in an immediate flood zone. Um, and uh, this is, um, this is a, a whole, uh, whole range of problems that's much more complex than just the buildings themselves. Um, the, just the point section of Newport represents, uh, I've forgotten at this point, but it's two or $300 million worth of taxable land. So uh, that gets redistributed. The insurance rates go up, other businesses fail. Um, and um, historically significant buildings and neighborhoods are important to tourism in New England, and that affects jobs and it's got a ripple effect. Um, Newport represents a significant portion of Rhode Island's um, entire tourism industry and the tourism industry in Rhode Island is indeed about a sixth of the entire economy. So uh, that's, um, uh, you know, you start to take these things into account. Um, so even if you're looking at uh, historic properties that are 15 or 20 or 30 feet above mean high, high water, and are probably not going to uh, be prone to the, the immediate problem um, of sea level rise, um, the rest of the community uh, can suffer such serious problems from this that it becomes, as Sarah suggested in her um, uh, uh, keynote speech, uh, this becomes a much more global issue that's not just us, but we are a big piece of it. Um, so there is this whole range of financial issues. Um, I think as um, both uh, Rodney and Chris suggested in their pieces, um, Flooding is, uh, advocacy is really important and flooding is always a local issue. This is one of the things that became very obvious to me um, when we were uh, dealing with the conference for the first time. Flooding is always a local issue. It's your municipality that has to deal with flooding issues. The state doesn't deal much with it and the federal government doesn't deal much with it. So in other words, the smallest and least capable uh, instrument of government um, is trying to deal with a global issue. Um, so I would suggest making sure as, um, as Mystic Seaport is, uh, where they're really becoming a gathering place for municipalities around them, um, push for a plan. Um, uh, uh, Portsmouth is obviously doing that for Strawberry Bank. Um, I have met with some of the people who are uh, town planners around Mystic. Um, Newport did really very little with this. Um, understand the extent of the insurance risks. Insurance is a big part of this. Um, lobby your congressmen and senators for favorable legislation that are going to help um, historic communities uh, weather this. Um, to just put an example out here, um, banks uh, on the point, if you bought a house there, they were making you take out the maximum flood insurance possible, which was $250,000 a year at that time, 2016. 
Um, and that flood insurance was costing up to $48,000 a year. That makes those houses completely unaffordable. Never mind if your museum is located on the point, as there are a couple. Um, it makes the entire point unaffordable. And um, I'm not saying that the federal government should cover all of these things, but uh, insurance is a big problem. And part of that problem was, as I suggested, when we had some of this flooding, in general, our uh, insurance needs were about $25,000, but the bank was enforcing a $250,000 insurance policy. And as Rodney and Chris have both pointed out, use your museum as a base for educating others. Um, we've talked about that. And so I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, <laughs> uh, this, um, this Walt Kelly uh, phrase um, from Pogo, well-known cartoon strip from back in the 50s and early 60s, um, was uh, he really wrote this about people littering on the landscape. Um, uh, so it was written for environmental purposes, but um, uh, it's no time uh, more true than it is now uh, with, um, uh, with climate change. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing, and I think we're ready to take some questions. So, Rainey, I think you're our moderator for questions. I am, and we don't have a chat feature on the Zoom for some reason, so I will just read them to you. Okay. Uh, the first question is, are we making headway toward quantifying what's at stake historically or culturally with climate change, i.e. the number of objects, historic sites impacted, economic impact, value to communities, et cetera? And I think the answer to that would be no. Um, uh, that is an effort that one would sort of expect, I think, from the National Park Service. Um, one of the people who I loved working with for Keeping History Above Water for the first conference was uh, Marcy Rockman um, from the National Park Service. And um, uh, climate change was an inconvenient truth for the uh, current administration, and Marcy um, uh, is no longer employed by the National Park Service, they dissolved her position. Um, so uh, she was the chief climate change specialist for the National Park Service. Um, so I, I think it's mostly local. Do you guys have any further perspective on that? So, no, you know, I think it's a lot of individuals looking at their, their own uh, issues and collections and how it's being affected, but uh, you know, I think it's definitely a, a place to sh make a giant inventory of that. That really shows the power of it that uh, could make some of that change uh, as we look at a new administration and uh, with local governments as well. So I think that is a great idea and you know, finding a framework to do that would be wonderful. It's a great question. And um, I would suggest that uh, it's a great topic for a museum advocacy day. Uh, to push um, that um, some sort of an inventory of places at risk. And it's in some ways might be a little easier than you think it is, um, but it's largely a local issue at this point. And I, I would just say that I think the local advocacy we've all talked about and are doing is toward that end. Um, it's really important for, for what you're experiencing to be known outside of your own community. So you know, whether you lecture, whether you write articles, whether you, um, we've got a couple of YouTube videos, you know, whatever you do to get the word out that your area is being impacted, it adds to the voices of many others. And eventually, uh, I think the, the federal advocacy will follow. Great. Uh, the next question is, are these rains having an impact on any archaeological sites on property or have the properties been already well excavated? And Rodney gave an answer, but if you don't mind sharing that to the group and then um, the others can chime in. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the, the answer, the short answer is yes. There's no doubt that archaeological um, treasures are being uh, impacted and perhaps lost as a result of the this flooding. Um, Story Bank has done archaeological in investigations over probably the last 40 years. I think the first one was in the 1960s. Uh, so that helps uh, minimize that. Uh, but it's very difficult to quantify what the impacts uh, of the floodwaters are, especially the groundwater, uh, to archaeological sites. Uh, I know across the world, um, sites are being relocated because they are at risk of being lost. That is not something that we've done here. 
We are doing archaeological investigations uh, based on what work has to be done to our buildings. Um, but that in itself does help protect those areas because once it's been uh, investigated, it, it's not so at risk from floodwaters. And uh, when I was in Rhode Island, I served on the Rhode Island Historical and Preservation, uh, Preservation and Heritage Commission. And there was a highly significant uh, Native American site in South County that was already uh, flooded out enough that there was a question about whether there really could ever be a significant archaeological dig there. And it's a, it was a community um, that uh, uh, really would have been uh, very educational and enlightening on um, Native American populations uh, in that part of uh, New England. So already gone. And I would also point out that um, uh, one of the projects that we focused on in keeping history above water uh, was a project in Scotland because um, large parts of the Scottish coast are just being washed away and they have a, an app that you can put on your phone and when you um, find uh, archaeological finds that are unexpectedly jutting out of the coastline, uh, which weren't more recently, uh, you can post it and it goes to a proper authority to at least be cataloged, if not actually examined. So next question. Many New England flood zone maps have been redrawn, even in Vermont, after the hurricane several years ago. Members of the public can relate to the cost of flood insurance. Is this another way of demonstrating the need for climate action, which I think you guys addressed in your presentation, but if you want to add anything. Um, there was one uh, person who we had speak um, at the conference, and he just sort of focuses on the insurance issues. Um, and the insurance is the insurance industry is, and I'm I'm talking from Hartford, Connecticut here, or close to it. Um, the insurance industry is very scattered in their understanding of this, and uh, I think there is a great um, need to uh, understand better ways to ensure historic sites in a very general way, but specifically as far as this goes to. And uh, it's difficult to move the insurance company, the insurance industry in any significant way on these issues. They tend to see it in a very bottom line way. What can museums do to educate visitors about problems related to climate change and historical buildings, even if the museum doesn't normally focus on this content? You guys should answer question. that. That's, that's, that you're, <laughs> that's you're, a, you're both that's doing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I would uh, I would argue it is absolutely crucial for institutions to teach what they're learning. Um, one I mean one reason is just to be relevant, um, but the second reason is uh, people need to understand. Um, the city of Portsmouth did a survey of something like 750 business and homeowners in the at-risk areas, as identified by the flood maps. Uh, about what was going on in their own basements. And the overall response was, I have no idea, I don't go down there. Um, so teaching, advocacy, getting the word out. Um, so how to do that? Well, the gallery I mentioned in my talk was one way that we're doing it. Um, exterior signage, I think is a super way uh, to get, uh, to, to attract that audience that's just walking by the museum or walking by your inst institution. Um, so that's another way. Um, social media, obviously, YouTube uh, seems to work really, really well, though it's not my strength. Um, but um, yeah, we're, we're looking for venues um, and then including it in our educational curriculum. So the, the information we send to schools about what we have to offer for field trips or for online um, experiences uh, will include our sea level rise initiative. Yeah, I'll follow up with that too. We're uh, looking at different ways of signage and, and really to bring the, uh, the experience of sea level rise to our visitors because it may be one of the only times that they're close to the coast to experience that and you know it's hard if it's a, a day where there isn't flooding to say well this is a huge problem but it's really easy to show graphic examples of a, of a line on a historic building that shows the high water mark for historical storms and and say, hey, in, in 2050, this is going to be normal. And we've got some some graphs and things that show that, you know, in 2050, what we have 10 or 12 times a year will be equal to Hurricane Gloria in the 1950s. Uh, so just 
a really easy way when you're next to the water to show that and it's a great time to share that with the public so we're really looking at implementing a lot of that to share with our uh, visitors i just have a follow-up question on that piece um how, how have you uh, dealt with climate change deniers? Have you had people confront your, the science you're presenting <laughs> in your exhibits? And how do you work with those people? Um, I, I'll, I'll go. I mean, I'll be the first to admit, and I'll probably get yelled at. Um, I don't preach climate change as part of what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm talking about sea level rise. Nobody will disagree that there's an issue with the seas rising. You can look out your window and see it. Um, it's it's what's causing that that is the controversial issue. And you know, frankly, though it matters, I don't want to take away from the importance of the waters destroying historic fabric. That's what really we need to deal with. Um, so that that conversation needs to be had, and that that debate needs to wage on. But uh, what I'm really concerned about is the waters are here; they're impacting our houses. And what can we do to inform the public and make adaptations to keeping them safe? Yeah, I'll echo that, uh, especially is, and I've not had an experience with uh, any climate change deniers, uh, but here's what's happening. You know, it doesn't matter what causes it. Uh, we probably all have our own beliefs on what causes it, but it, it's happening and we need to address it. And I would say just <laughs> interestingly on the, uh, the, science denier, I probably we've all experienced uh, more of that this summer with uh, coronavirus and uh, COVID than, than we've seen with the uh, climate change side. I have seen a few uh, deniers um, and uh, I do a little consulting on this and uh, I, like like the two of you guys, I I just don't deal with the controversial side of it. I don't I don't pretend to be a scientist. I do not talk about what's actually causing this. I am talking about an observable effect that is getting worse and that we have to deal with. And it makes it much less controversial. Um, it's not that I'm afraid of get engaging in the controversy. Uh, it's just that when you're trying to make recommendations to people and get people to understand the issue, it is better to deal with observable issues and um, stay away from the controversy unless you actually have to wade into it. One session that I was doing um, at a conference, oh gosh, I can't, I guess it was here in Connecticut. Um, a woman stood up during the Q and A and she said, well, when this is over, uh, when we all get back to normal, um, and I said, let me stop you there. I said, we're dealing with a planetary scale system and I said, there is enough inertia baked into this that even if we did everything exactly right, right this moment, which obviously isn't happening, it would take anywhere between 250 and 500 years to get back to where we are now at the present day. So, and that's just based on the science of seeing where this is going um, and how, how we're gonna be in the future. I'd also add that um, one thing we can do uh, is help the scientific community that is waging this debate um, with actual evidence of what we're seeing. Uh, so yeah, we, Story Bank, one of the first things we did was create this incredible um, uh, video that's on YouTube. Um, it was done by our photographer. Um, and it, it sort of in a three minute nutshell talks about groundwater intrusion. Um, something scientists have been talking to a while, but there's been no visual a, a depiction of it. So now here's an example, and they love that, you know, it really helps them make their case, but we let them make that case. As I suggested in my, um, in my session, um, section of the session, um, people do tend to feel that history is somehow immutable. If their great, great grandparents saw this and they're seeing it, they assume that it's not going to change. Uh, when in fact, as I, as I said, uh, within the next hundred years, the shoreline is going to change fundamentally on a global scale um, in ways that have not been seen since the last ice age. And so to draw that mental picture of Ellis Island being underwater or 
the Statue of Liberty being unapproachable. Not that the Statue of Liberty would disappear. You'll see these images of the Statue of Liberty where, you know, she's underwater. That's not going to happen. But Bedloe Island could be uh, unapproachable, uh, at least on certain days. That tends to draw a very graphic picture to people that otherwise are not capable of grasping this situation. You know, part of the problem is that climate change, and part of the reason that I wanted to do this conference to begin with, is that climate change moves in ways that aren't easily observable to us. You know, we're used to sound bites, things that happen in seconds or minutes. Um, and this is happening slowly over the course of our lifetimes, but geologically it's happening incredibly rapidly. All right. <clears throat> um... Peter, what is the Inland Mark Twain House and Museum doing to help mitigate the climate crisis and educate the public? So it's not as big an issue for the Twain House. Um, and we do not, um, we talk about a lot of other things. We talk about politics, we talk about social change, we talk about social justice. Um, so I more deal with this privately right now, but I can tell you that the observable effects of climate change on the house are uh, that the drainage system um, was designed uh, for the 1870s and it doesn't handle major rain events very well. Um, I can tell you that the entire site doesn't handle them very well. So we've had to take, um, take action on those. And uh, just because of my interest in this subject and the fact that I'm vested in it, um, we put out things in social media occasionally. When we've done something, uh, we'll point it out, um, but it's not as central to our mission, especially being located up on a hill where we are um, and pretty well drained. It's just not as much of an issue um, for us. So we pick other social issues. And that sort of dovetails, I'll send this out to the rest of the um, panelists. Someone asks about what inland museums and sites can do to raise awareness um, and mitigate climate change. Well, um, the inland places, and I, I throw this over to you guys too, but um, I think for a lot of people, the inland issues are flooding that has never occurred before or might not have occurred yet. Uh, but a lot of it is riverine flooding. Um, rivers that have never been a problem in the past are going to start to become a problem. And a lot of it has to do with that 71% increase in major rain events. Um, Rhode Island had a flooding event that had nothing to do with the coastline uh, in 2010, but it was dreadful. Um, and there was Vermont uh, suffering the after effects of a hurricane and having absolutely cataclysmic events um, to everywhere in the state or a lot of places in the state. Um, Rodney, Chris? Yeah, I would say that, you know, just as you mentioned with hurricanes, uh, with, you know, Irene, bringing tons of water into places and uh, flooding. Uh, folks that think they're maybe uh, safe from hurricanes are seeing effects of those and mm. with the more rain. Uh, I remember right after Irene coming down the Hudson on a ship and passing a house and that house wasn't, you know, a storm surge catastrophe. I mean, passing a house floating in the river. And we've even had that just upriver from Mystic Seaport where it's not a uh, storm surge, but a bridge knocked out just a, a mile upriver from here Yep. Uh, from heavy rain experience. And I think many localities are seeing that and tying it into uh, to climate change is going to. So, you know, I think one of the things that you can do is advocacy. Be aware of the floodplains around you. Be aware of the riverine uh, flooding possibilities. Um, and um, be prepared when something happens uh, from an advocacy point of view again um, to... Um, uh, to point this out and to point it out in particular, not only to your audiences, but to your legislators as well. Uh, you know, the problem is that um, the legislators are not all concentrated on the coastline where the biggest effects of this are being seen now. They are distributed in a lot of inland areas, some of which may never have had any effect yet. And I think the yet is a big underlined word there. I totally agree. I think if you feel like you're not impacted by climate change and sea level rise at this point, um, wait, yeah. you probably will, or do some more digging because you actually may be and you're not aware of it as yet. Um, you know, it, it's important that you have a, a complete picture. You know, do you, are you aware of what the groundwater levels are under your museum, your historic sites? Uh, 
Uh, are you aware of uh, the volumes of water that are falling from the sky now versus what they used to be? Uh, as as uh, Peter said, is your drainage system able to handle increases in um, rainfall? Um, these are all things that are actually being studied right now. Um, one of our sister organizations in New England is looking at the dimensions of their uh, gutters and downspouts. Um, how much water can they handle and what can they do to increase that volume because they need to. Uh, Castle in the Clouds had a beautifully invented uh, drainage system that brought the water from the downspouts into their basement because uh, that's how the original owner of the Castle in the Clouds wanted it. Um, Great idea back then, not so much right now. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, these are all things you should be looking at and, and asking questions about and just document, document, document. If you hear someone say, geez, I've never seen water there before, that's a great picture to take. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's true too that um, uh, the way, and Rodney touched on this, the way buildings were designed uh, historically was to deal with one set of um, climate issues. And it's a different set that we're coming into now. And uh, as a result, um, you can look at simple gable roofs and they're pretty good at shedding the water. But when you get into ultra complex uh, Victorian massing, um, you know, we've, we've got a, a stick style house uh, that Twain built and it's incredibly complex and it builds an ice dam in one place that to me has been uh, exacerbated by climate change. And so there, there is a spot where we pointed out to people that this was probably not something that the Clemens family ever saw when they were in residence, um, but it's weighing on the roof. Uh, it was causing um, ice damming and a series of, um, of problems for interior flooding in the house. Um, and it's a pretty dramatic picture. I should have included it because um, it's a good example of what, what can happen during climate change to a certain kind of place. Uh, Chris, this question is for you. Several years ago, I saw a thorough emergency plan for Mystic Seaport. Has that plan been enlarged to have specific plans and actions for the high water situations not associated with trackable storms? That's a, that's a great question and we do have a great uh, emergency plan and we have been revising it recently and one of the interesting things is there's a, a most of that plan was to uh, address uh, tropical storms and the flooding and emergencies resulting from those and what's interesting is what uh, was considered an emergency when that document was put together it has become kind of commonplace. So we've addressed a bit and changed that so uh, you know it it was a great plan that gave, you know, five days before the storm, three days before the storm, a day and gather materials and where would the command post be. And in a way, we uh, we now can have that kind of event happening with, you know, nearly no notice. So uh, what has become, was designed as an emergency plan is almost turning into a standard operating plan and looking at other issues that are addressed in the emergency plan. But it is a great example of why such a document needs to be a really living document uh, so that it addresses the problems as you're facing them and review them to, uh, you know, perhaps say, this isn't just something that's an emergency now, this is something that we're dealing with on a uh, weekly or monthly basis. But uh, thanks for pointing that out. And I've been deeply involved in uh, looking at that document and uh, it's, it's a great piece of work. Yeah, if you're on the coastline and you don't have a, a hurricane preparedness plan or a flooding preparedness plan, you need to do it. Um, it's really important. We had we had both at NRF. Um. So I think that is all the questions so far. Uh, there are some lively conversations taking place in the chat feature on Whova. Um, specifically, Sarah has answered some additional questions and given links and resources for what inland museums can do, including cutting energy use to reduce contributions to the impacts, pay attention to surface water flooding during storms, reduce contributions to heat island effect in communities full of hard surfaces. In other words, use less energy, use plantings that absorb water and infrastructure that slows its path to storm sewers, and then plant trees and gardens to create public green spaces for gathering in cool during the hot season. Yeah, I didn't cover that, but there are a variety of different, and you touched on it a little bit, Chris, in terms of thinking about landscaping. There's a variety of things that you can do that are really positive with landscaping to um, uh, either um, 
block the water through berming um, or to gather it and keep it um, so that you're using it appropriately. Um, uh, you can use uh, various kinds of plantings as a sponge in essence, um, and that can help too. Um, yeah, I'll make a shout out to, to Rain Gardens. Um, is something that we're gonna be doing hopefully in the next five years as a partnership with the city of Portsmouth. Uh, they've been installing rain gardens around city property for a number of years. Um, we've advocated that we would be a great site to do a couple um, that we can then teach with. Um, and that it also helps to absorb some of the great quantities of water that are falling on Puddle Dock uh, and coming in from the higher surrounding neighborhoods. So um, that's a really good use for our site uh, and one that would help our site. Uh, so another really good partnership. I would add in on that with, you know, if, if anyone is looking at facilities changes to, uh, to anything as little as landscaping, parking lots, uh, you know, really have this first in mind from a permeability standpoint, from a uh, stormwater management standpoint. Um, if, you, if you have drawings or plans for any proposed modifications to any of your structures, just make sure they're re-reviewed with, uh, with these topics in mind because uh, you don't want to build something today that's susceptible to these issues. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point, Chris. Um, you're not just thinking about the next 10 years. Um, you're thinking about the next 20, uh, 30, or 50 years. Um, don't make your successors hate you uh, by having failed to plan properly for this. I, I think one of the great joys for me uh, in in historic preservation was truly being able to think long-term. And I think as museum people, we think that way too. Um, you know, you talk to a financial person and they say, well, three years is long-term. No, for me, 20, 50 and hundred years is long-term. And trying to envision where this problem is going to be in 50 years is tough because the scientists don't know how much the water level is going to go up. Um, as I said, could be as little as three feet could be as much as 12 or even more. Um, I think most people are sort of settling on the six to eight foot range um, by the end of this century. So that's a safe working margin, but gosh, there's so many different publications out there that will prognosticate on this. And it's a little, it can get a little bewildering and you just have to do the best you can, but, but you should be thinking much longer term than just 10 years. Can I just add uh, one thing? Uh, the person who asked about what inland museums can do and really what anyone can do. Um, your institutions, regardless of where they are geographically, are impacted by the greater community. So uh, what is your town doing to prepare for disasters? Um, you know, your power comes from somewhere, your water and sewer comes from somewhere. How, what is the, are those infrastructures at risk, even if your institution's not? So ask those questions, go to your city leaders, find out what they're doing, what you can do to help. Um, it's, it's really a community issue, not just a site by site. Yeah, I think Rodney, you said you'd be surprised at how few people are talking to each other. I don't remember it was you, Chris. Absolutely right. Most people are not talking to each other about this issue. It's the elephant in the room. And uh, it's a great role for museums. We all talk about ourselves as conveners. Well, this is a great opportunity to be that really feel good convener where you're really doing something good. Um, and uh, it was a big role for us at NRF when we first did this in 2016, because the city of Newport was not doing much. I don't know what they're doing now. I haven't lived there in several years, but um, uh, they really weren't doing much. And it did wake up a lot of the city councilors. Um, and as Sarah suggested in her keynote, um, it's a big problem and there's big solutions and we're not the whole solution, but we can really make a significant difference. All right, so I think that uh, is our time, first of all, and also we were able to get to all the questions, but I do have lots of compliments that um, are coming in, that this was a really great session and people are really grateful for the information that you presented. Well, so thank you all for coming and- Thank you. Yeah, and guys, thank you. I, this was a great group, I thought, so. A lot of fun. Thanks, Peter. Enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.